Hey there, Berlin. Before we start the show, we have an important announcement. If you've ever wanted to join Phil and Eric on a live recording of Potluck Food Talks, this is your chance. On October 14th, we're going to be at the Pot Festival Berlin. What are they going to talk about? Sandwiches. Yummy. So what's the deal with sandwiches, you ask? Delicious. BLT, the Reuben, the Clubhouse, the Grilled Cheese, the Fried Chicken. Not only will Phil and Eric take you on a mouth-watering journey around what makes the best fucking sandwiches in the world, you'll also get to try Phil's own creation after the show. Yes. The perfect marriage of crispy fried chicken and artisan bread harmonized with heavenly sauces. Don't worry, there will also be veggie alternatives. So if you're in Berlin or need an excuse to come to the city, join us on Saturday, October 14th, starting at 11 a.m. at the Podfest Berlin. All the info will be in the description below or on podfestberlin.com. That's podfestberlin.com. Okay, now on with the show. morning Vietnam. No, I'm sorry, that's, that's the wrong, wrong intro. That's the wrong podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, unless we're in, we were in Vietnam, that would be like really cool. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Potluck Food Talks. Today, I'm here with my homie, Phil Walter, and we're going to talk about terroir. Terroir. So what's the deal with terroir? What is the deal with terroir? What a, what a mysterious uh, and uh, strange word. I mean, like, what, what, what do you think of when you think of terroir? Well, it's a word commonly uh, associated to to the wine world, but I think in the last decade it has also been adapted uh, in the gastronomy world and the chef world to explain that there is this common, uh, how to say, tag called time and place, uh, which means what grows at what time and what place, meaning basically plants and animals, edible plants and animals. And this whole ecosystem, how it feeds itself and how it nourishes itself from the water, the plants that eat the animals, the animals that die and feed the soil and, and all this, uh, how to say, life cycle that occurs there and generates... A, the circle of life. Exactly, that generates basically wonderful flavors. The more rich this ecosystem is, the richer it will taste whatever is produced there. That's my thought about it. Yeah. And, um, you know, just like you said, this like term time and place really got coined. And I think like it's kind of become like a phrase that's like overused by sort of like every kind of like little bistro says, oh, yeah, you know, there's a time and a place. What were you thinking when you made this dish? Sort of like, man, I really wanted to evocate a sense of time and place, you know. But yeah, you, you know, it's um, it's crazy how the locality and the sort of like thing that restaurants have been trying to evoke in people has really kind of evolve because it used to be kind of like well this is an italian this is a restaurant in emilia romana for example you know and it makes dishes from emilia romana so that's the terroir you know that's the region but nowadays the term means not just that you know but like a lot of other mm -hmm. things as well yeah absolutely also go going back to the wine because it, it's interesting the wine world because it's all about one product right the grape And everybody talks about the soil, the climate, the, the minerals in the soil, the if it's near the sea, the altitude, and all of these different aspects just to, about the grape. But if you expand this to, to all the vegetables that are around and all the resources that you could have that you could incorporate into a menu in a restaurant or even into a food identity of a country, for me, that's the work. Because, I mean, I come from an ex-colonial country which is all of the Americas. And you will clearly see that in the Americas, there is not a, a sense of the war as strong as you will see in Europe. For instance, things that have become like new trends, like uh, eating local products in season is something that has been done, for instance, here in the Basque Country for the last 25,000 years, precisely because of this, uh, because of all of the aftermath that generates a process like a colonization uh, that destroys the local identities and new identities emerge. I think that those are kind of uh, challenges where terror comes into play. And it's something that we have seen not only in the Americas with projects like, like what, what uh, Virgilio is doing in Peru and, and, and other chefs like, like uh, Borago also that, that are working only with things that grow around the restaurant, but also even in 
projects like, well, we'll get into that later, like Noma, that had also incorporated into their menus and, and cities like, like Copenhagen, you would see products like olive oil and chocolate. And suddenly they said, okay, let's make a, a restaurant concept that do not include these ingredients because of a philosophy that will only work with local produce. And yeah, that reshapes the food identity of a city, a country, or or let's say like a whole gastronomic movement, which is what happened in the Nordic countries. But I think I, I went too far in history to, or too forward. Let, let's go step by step. <laughs> yeah, no, but you're totally right. You know, it's super, super interesting. And like, it's it's a very complex thing because like you say, you know, terroir, it doesn't just talk about the type of product, but also, you know, like you said, with like, for example, like, you know, if you take the example of a grape, with altitude, you know, altitude also will affect a region's ancient techniques, you know, and like how they prepare food, you know, the weather, the the seasons, they all, you know, affect, you know, what the traditional products are and the techniques that are used to elaborate those products, right? And so it's kind of like when we look at like Nordic food, for example, it's like, oh yeah, there's lots of like ferments and preserves and plants and stuff. It's like, yeah, that's not because they wanted to do that. Like it's because it was a necessity. And a necessity, the necessity then became like the rule, you know, and then got refined and refined and refined. And out of like a difficulty, people started exploring the possibilities inside of what is possible in those parameters and refined it to find really, really great things that they then adapted as their own. So that's super, super interesting. I will mention just something really quick because it has nothing to do with terroir, but I think it's super interesting because you mentioned altitude. And I lived two years in La Paz, in Bolivia, which is one of the highest cities in the world. Uh, then you have El Alto, which is even higher. I think it's 4,000 meters. I think El Alto is uh, one of the highest cities in the world. Wow. So what happens there? The atmospheric pressure changes. So all the physics laws change, which means uh, water boils at 80 degrees and bread needs 50% more water and rice needs 40 minutes to cook and all these kind of things. So all the rules change because you're in like, like in a different physical environment. So imagine... That's crazy. So this is what happens with cooking. And there are like specific books about this, about altitude cooking, like uh, cities, like also in Switzerland, there are a lot of very high cities that also have to have the, the, this kind of things in, in consideration. But yeah, imagine the same happening in the soil with the food, with everything that grows, with all the animals, with, with everything. And that, of course, has a, an impact on the flavor profile that develops in a microclimate, basically. Yeah, absolutely. It's super, super interesting. There is this uh, saying from Jose Andres that really stuck to me. He said, if it grows together, it goes together. And I think that applies not only regionally, but also seasonal. You know, like if it grows in the same place and the same season, I mean, you you can randomly put those things in a plate with a very simple seasoning and it should work, you know? Mm, I think that's a very, I, I'll have to think about that statement for a little bit. I yeah, I mean, but yeah. yeah. It, 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 it does seem to make sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that of course, that there will be like error ranges that, oh, oops, we added like this super aromatic thing that also grows here. Yeah. <laughs> it's it sounds good definitely but you know Jose Andres is very good at saying things that sound yeah, good you know that's I, awesome. take, I take every that's I take that's everything that he says with a pinch of salt now uh, since he's been going on about the peeled strawberry ah yeah but, you yeah, know. yeah yeah that's <laughs> something worth watching so everybody can pause now this podcast go to YouTube watch <laughs> Jose Andres talking about strawberries and come back to understand the joke yeah <laughs> and uh, com compare what did he do compare a peeled strawberry have you ever had a peeled strawberry? It's, uh... <laughs> I love to peel the strawberries. It's nothing like when your lips contact a skinless strawberry. You understand that the strawberry was created to be loved by you, by all. <laughs> it's like a passionate kiss from your lover. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. But going yeah, back go, to the right. going, going back a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, what I think is super interesting is that like jump from, you know, when restaurants were kind of like in a place, you know, uh, with not that much sort of infrastructure cooking the dishes that um, were, you know, their own, because usually the people that cook in the region are from the region, or if not, they want to, you know, serve something that is familiar, you know, where there's a connection. And for me, like, in the sort of like, you know, Novelle Cuisine, it's, it was really Michel Bra who kind of like really went in depth 
on the terroir. And of course, like he also started out cooking, you know, traditional dishes from the Auvergne and, um, you know, still did until like the very end. But he then went like a step beyond where he just really looked at the ingredients, the seasons and just the landscape itself and really like dove into the nature and got super, super inspired by that. And you can really see like Michel Bras is super interesting because on one side, his dishes look like a white canvas and, and also everything like in his restaurant, all the tables and everything. And then he, he actually, that, that crazy statement from Jos Andres that if it grows together, it goes together. I think that's kind of like what Michel Bras puts on a plate are things that grow together around his restaurant. Some of these are wild plants that, that have been foraged and put in the in the menu. And and yeah, I think he was, like you said, the most radical in this sense of, of cooking in terroir. But I think terroir existed since food exists because people used to eat what they had around, basically, you know? Like and and yeah. and the con the modern concept of restaurant and chef comes from castles where where they would make the this fancy dinners for royalty. And they would also cook with what they had in their surroundings. But I think like our civilization evolved into something so bizarre uh, that you go to a forest with a, a beautiful river with the most delicious water in the world and you're drinking imported water from Italy, you know, which is a, yeah. a, in, a, in a plastic bottle, which is an, an absolute bullshit, you know. And that's the way a lot of people think because nobody thinks about it, you know, about this kind of thing, about where stuff comes from and, and these kind of things. So uh, one of the protégés, I would say, or, or someone who was super influenced by Michel Bra is, of course, Andoni from Mugaritz, where we both work. Yeah. And he also got radical into, at least in one of his periods, I would say, I, I, I wouldn't say so bold that, that that's what he's doing still, but I would say in the mid 2000s, which is the season where, where I was there, we would go to the forest and forage. We would serve also water from the river at the restaurant. I mean, why would you bring water from a river from Italy if you have a river just in front of you, you know? Yeah. And all these kind of things of, of working with the surrounding is, is super interesting. Flowers, herbs, uh, mushrooms, pieces of wood. I mean, that there's so many things that can be transformed into, into delicious food. Yeah, totally. And then, you know, and then it goes beyond that, you know, and then it's not just like the ingredients, but it's also just the impression, you know, in the case of Michel Bra, you know, the like beautiful Auvergne, you know, with like the like little rivers and the white fields and stuff, you know, and the like lush green and that sort of stuff. Or if you take the Basque Mountains, you know, with like the rocks and also the rivers and, ah, and, this, and the sheep, you know, the pastures, the the coast, all that sort of stuff. And because obviously like in this sort of level of cooking, we're talking about a very artistic approach in cooking. And I feel like that that was one of the like big steps also in that sort of time where there was an artistic interpretation of the terroir, not just in the ingredients, but in the impressions and in the, in like in an emotional and sort of like feeling sort of side. Yeah, I absolutely understand what you mean. Like if you see dishes from restaurants like Borago, Noma, Mugaritz, or Michel Bra, you will notice that, that somehow the dishes visually communicate the surrounding. Like it's kind of yeah. a, like, like a landscape uh, on the plate. Yeah, like not Narizawa, you know, like look exactly. at the dishes from Narizawa. Exactly. It's like a, like a forest, you know, but it's like not in a sort of molecular way necessarily, or, you know, like a Gargiyu, you know, it's like a, I mean, that is like a snippet of like that day, you know? Yeah, like, like, like you have really the, like this forest feeling or this nature feeling. If we, if we go to the opposite radical of this, the complete opposite would be, for instance, Tim Bauer. You know, he's like anti-terroir. Like he will cook with, with ingredients that come from Asia and combinate them with uh, whatever it's in the city. And, and it's a completely different approach for a restaurant proposal. I have nothing to say about Tim Bauer. I'm not <laughs> going to talk about Tim Bauer. Um, yeah, but like even, you know, it's kind of like, like, uh, this like green and vegetable and plant and herb thing is one thing, but like, for example, when I, you know, like mugaritz, you know, with the walnuts, right? Yeah. With the lechos. No, and not the lechos. No, the one that's after that. And it was like filled with like, um, 
ah, oh, what was in there? Was it like cheese cream or something like that? But basically it looked like a walnut and it was so evocative of like the seeded ideas and stuff like that, you know, where you eat walnuts at the cider houses afterwards with ingredients that are, you know, very, very much, you know, representative of the region um, and of the feeling of wood and dairy and obviously nuts and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, also that dish with the lechos, ferns in English. Uh, I mean, yeah. you look at that dish and you feel like, like you're seeing, I don't know, like, like a landscape with snow and plants and something like that. It really tells a story somehow, you know, like you, you just, just uh, with the plating. Yeah, it really does. Absolutely. Same with Narizawa. I see Narizawa dishes and I feel like I'm in a Japanese forest. Absolutely. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, like, I mean, that, that is actually uh, one of the perfect examples for Terora, his soil soup. Have you, you, you've heard of the soil soup, right? No, no, I don't know that soup. Uh, describe it. Tell, it, so tell us about it. He, he, um, this, this might sound really bonkers. And I mean, it is because he's a bonkers guy in the best possible way. But he basically goes to this one part in the countryside where there's really high quality soil and picks it up. And it's this really pure, dark sort of humus sort of soil. And he makes a soup with that soil. You know, when you dig into the ground and you have this smell of like deep, rich, healthy earth. And he wanted to um, put that sensation into a dish. Well, you, you, you remind me of a dish. I think this is one of the most creative dishes I've ever heard of. And, uh, and also like a super clever wordplay in Spanish, surf and turf. It's called Mari Montaña, which means a sea and mountain. And John Roca, he made this dish where he distillated a soil like the one you described with, you know, like a soil, with this dark soil that you take in the forest and you smell it and you, it smells like forest. Yeah. And he made a, a distillation out of it. So he had a, just a very pure water with that aroma. Yeah. And he would add that to oysters and that's Mari Montaña. Yeah. You know, that's, that's just really cool. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's crazy. You know, and that's kind of like just really thinking about evoking a really deep felt sensation of a place, you know, and that's really kind of like a very, very uniquely like unique to cooking expression of terror, you know? Man, that's why I get back to the, these ideas that I started the, talking about post-colonization and blah, blah, blah. Because as I said, I come from Venezuela and in Venezuela, I think I've, I've said this before, there are many traditional dishes that are based on imported products. Of course, this is a consequence of, of colonies, but, but why do we have like the, one of our most traditional dishes need uh, raisins, olives, capers, and some wine from South Spain? And, and you know, th those are all things that are not produced in Venezuela and the ones that are sent there are not the highest quality, are the cheapest, you know, like we're yeah. buying the, the, the cheapest things from other countries to produce our, our own traditions. I think that, that's just wrong. I think that, 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 that should just be reinvented, especially if we're talking about one of the countries with, with, with the richest biodiversities in the world. And there has to be so many ingredients that haven't been uh, used uh, to, to its full potential. And that's something that I found really interesting with the Nordic movement, just to, to say a short introduction. So we talk about Nouvelle Cuisine. This is something that happened in the 60s. Then in the 70s, there was a movement here in the Basque country called the New Basque Cuisine. They brought a manifesto and they also incorporated traditional recipes from grandmothers into high-end restaurants. They kind of replicated the Nouvelle Cuisine. Then in the... 90s, we had the Spanish avant-garde led by Ferran Adria. What they did is they, they started like making mm, very creative and crazy combinations on, on technique and flavor combinations to, to just to do all things that was possible and try everything, all possible combinations of techniques and flavors and everything to a point that, that, that it became really baroque. And then... Uh, so, so the, there was like a saturation of over information, of over combinations, of over yeah. things in the plate. And then suddenly everything got plain again with the Nordic movement that said, okay, let's just uh, focus on, on, on the terroir, on the, the surroundings, on time and place. And one thing that I found super interesting is once I tried a, a whey ice cream, you know, whey, just something that, that is usually thrown away. It's usually garbage. Like nobody would cook with that. 
and then they they aromatize like a milk and make an uh, ice cream with that. And it's delicious and a completely different flavor I've never tried before, you know? Yeah. And they use that, but for instance, vanilla is forbidden. And I think that's so clever because it is much cheaper and has so much identity and and so much sense, like socially, economically, like in so many senses. You yeah, know? sustainably. Yeah, totally. And, you know, creatively also, you know, it's kind of like you set yourself limitations and it's kind of like, well, why wasn't whey used? You know, whey is an amazing product. And nowadays it's like really, really used in kitchens. But, you know, it's kind of like people weren't looking at it. It's not people weren't not using whey because it's bad. It was just sort of like, well, we're not doing anything with this. You know, we're just going to throw it away. And it was it, it was just not the trend, you know, like it wasn't a trend. It wasn't what people are used to, you know, what the, like the routine was, you know, and these sorts of limitations, you know, they really push the creative boundaries to look at things a different way to kind of take a few steps back and broaden your horizon and look at things with a fresh perspective. And that opened up, you know, infinite options. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think, again, this is something that has always existed. The the person that first ate an artichoke had to be really hungry to do that, you know, yeah. uh, to, to see something, okay, let, let's cook this. Maybe it's delicious, you know, and that's what, what the new Nordic movement just brought to a complete different level, looking around, then influential chefs around the world started imitating all, all the things. Uh, I remember Grant Akats from Chicago. He once wanted to do a stock with wood. So he called it woodstock, you know, but then yeah. t taking just logs of wood and throwing them into water and cooking them to eat that is it's not common sense, you know? It's something that yeah. like, you have to come up with that and also pull it off and do it correctly. So it's something really worth doing, you know? Yeah, totally. Tell us about Pavik and you, you work there, right? Or, or you visit the... Yeah, I, I staged there for a few months. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, that was also a restaurant with an, an incredible sense of terroir, you know, very, very, very local in both the ingredients and the techniques and also in the research of old techniques of that region. Um, so Favikin was located in the very north of Sweden um, on the border of Norway uh, in an area called Jämtland. And it was uh, close to like a ski resort in the middle of the forest. And the chef, Magnus Nielsen, amazing chef, uh, he he started it there on, on an old like hunting estate. There was nothing really there. And he just started cooking, you know, like going out, shooting, game. It was really, really beautiful because he just focused on getting, it was very simple really, but like incredibly complicated in its like simplicity. He just focused on getting super, super good ingredients throughout the season and then preparing them, putting them together in a creative way with incredibly, incredibly sharp technique. And so, you know, drawing on the, the, the meat elements, drawing on the seafood elements, you know, the sort of like river fish, the seafood he would get from Norway, you know, and then just like really, really just focusing on the basics. Like I've got a really good king crab. Just cook that king crab perfectly. Get the best king crab you can, cook it perfectly, and then just add one or two things to complement that. He did that with a, a lot of things, you know, get a really good retired dairy cow, you know, cook that piece of meat absolutely perfectly, one or two things to complement it, and that's it. And it was like one of the purest and also one of the best restaurants I've ever been in. Yeah, I, I feel it was one of the best restaurants in the world when it was active. For sure, yeah. How long did it close? Like four years already? I think so, right? Well, I think you're right. Seems like a long time, but I think you're right, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah it's yeah. a shame. Yeah. It's a real shame. Yeah, another, another good example is Cox in the Faroe Islands. That's, again, that's a restaurant that literally has only its surroundings because it's in the middle of nowhere. Other examples could be Borago in Chile, Gusto, where I worked in, in Bolivia. Yeah. There was also Pedro Schiaffino in Peru. Uh, he had like this restaurant called Amas. Well, the restaurant was in the city. But everything from that restaurant would work with Amazonian produce. Yeah. Yeah. But I think like that, like the concept of having the restaurant not in the place already breaks the terroir concept. Totally. You can do like a, how to say, imagine like a, a, a terroir from, from some forest in New York. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it doesn't work yeah. like that. It has to be in the place. Yeah, totally. Totally. And I think it's a trend that's like really cool. You know, I mean, like trend is kind of like, like calling it a trend doesn't really do it justice because it's kind of going back to basics, you know, and to 
it makes sense sustainably, you know, it makes sense. It, logistically, it makes sense. But like even like smaller restaurants that, you know, my restaurant does the same thing, you know, we're based in Berlin and we only use products from the region. We only, we don't go outside of Brandenburg and mm-hmm. uh, which is the area outside of Berlin. And, you know, that means no olive oil, no lemons, you know, fish, like we can't get fish from the North Sea or from Brittany or whatever, something that's like normal for other restaurants. What does that do? Like we said before, you know, it's kind of like, well, first of all, you put a lot of time and effort into finding the best products from the region. And like, what do you find? You find like a small guy who runs like a lake community that does incredibly high quality um, soft water fish, you know? like trouts and stuff, a sturgeon, amazing stuff, best sturgeon I've ever had, you know? And, you know, you find people that make cold pressed rapeseed oil, you know, rapeseed oil, that's usually like a cooking oil, but like cold pressed, super high quality, intensely yellow, super fragrant. And you find all these interesting things. Of course you can use olive oil, but it's actually really, really interesting to find these sorts of things. And then kind of like, and it has a lot of, you know, it's very real in a way. And it's very authentic in its own because like it doesn't then really matter like how you put these things together. They're always going to be authentically from that place, you know. That's it for this week's episode of Potluck Food Talks. If you like what we're doing, make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. You can also find us on Instagram and TikTok as Potluck Food Talks. The show airs every Monday 